you win as a team, it's a whole team effort. Not one person gets a trophy. Right. Not, not one one person is considered a loser. So I give them a lot of credit for taking the heat off them for a week. But just go out there, play, relax, and you know, play this game as if you would play a play a playground football game. You know, kids play football because they love the sport and they have fun doing it. Approach it the same way. If you win, great. If you lose, great. You know what? You understand what you did wrong. You can correct it and go back and try again. Right. But just go out there, worry about Holy Cross. Go watch the film on them. You know, there's there's what four weeks of film now going on them. So just go out there, understand their game plan, understand their best player, understand their tendencies. And just play the game you love to play and have fun. You know, and, and with having this game moving forward, obviously you as a former running back here with Robert Drummond played for Syracuse in the uh, late 80s, 87 undefeated team, went on to the NFL and the CFL as well. So Rob with myself here, Dan Tortoise, the Wildcats Sports Club, 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus, New York, post game for Western Michigan at Syracuse, 52-33 win by Syracuse. You being a former running back on the team, it was nice that Mo Neal, well, I'm a big fan, known, I've known him, known his family for the last few years, the last four years, and he's been a tremendous player from Gastonia, North Carolina. There's a lot of guys, there are a lot of teams that were going after Mo Neal that wanted Mo Neal out of that kind of Charlotte area of North Carolina. Syracuse ends up keeping him. Schaefer recruited him and DeAndre Smith, former running backs coach, and then Babers only kept four guys from that class. Kept Rex Culpepper, Scoop Bradshaw, Sam Heckel, and Mo Neal. And Mo Neal was able to bookend it today. He got a rushing touchdown at the beginning of the game in the first quarter and a rushing touchdown in the fourth quarter to end the game. Just what you could say about Mo and, and his ability and being a former running back, seeing him take care of the ball in the beginning and take care of it at the end. You know, it's, it's interesting to watch Mo this year for the simple fact of uh, going into this year, I was looking up stats, you know, just on Syracuse, not Syracuse.com, but Syracuse University website. You know, and um, Mo, Mo Neal has a chance, actually, um, if he rushes for six point, I think 6.2 or 6.3 yards this year uh, to overtake me as a, as a third leading a third leading yards per carry rusher behind Jim Brown, excuse me, behind Ernie Davis and Jim Brown. Yeah. I'm, third, I'm third in SU history. But I think a five point, I don't know what it is, but I know I'm third in SU history in yards per carry. Yeah. And Mo Neal has a chance to actually break that. So I'm actually rooting for him because the records are meant to be broken, you know. And uh, that's, it's, for me, it's an honor, you know, to be, to be in the same class and be uh, in annals and compared, you know, to someone like a Jim Brown or Ernie Davis who are um, Syracuse University superstars. You know, yeah. so for me to be the third time yards per carry average rusher in Syracuse University history, you know, it's, it's, it's an honor. But to have a young man like that, have an opportunity to, to, to surpass me, you know, is a testament to the type of player he is because I know the type of player I was because of the hard work and dedication I put into a city, you know, I was born in. You know, I played Pop Warner here. I played Pop Warner, actually, for West Tennessee my first couple of years, you know, playing football. Yeah. Uh, then I went on to JD, you know, to be a star. I went on to Syracuse and now to the NFL. But it's just an honor for me to be able to go up there and, and see a young man put as much heart, as much dedication into, into being the best he possibly can be and have a chance you know, to be talked about with the likes of, a, you know, of Ernie Davis or Jim Brown. I don't consider myself in their class, but unfortunately the, 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 the numbers speak for themselves. So it's, yeah. it's an honor. And it's, a, it's fun watching him this year, you know, because I, I, I hope he gets it. I hope he breaks it. But whatever he does, I'm always in his corner. I'm always rooting for him. You know, and Mo Neal has been such a consummate professional through all of this. He's been an H-back. He's been kind of a wide receiver. He's been a true running back. They used him all over the place from when he came in with Schaefer and Lester's group and everybody to where he is now with Mike Lynch and, and obviously with Dino Babers. So he's put on weights. He's He's been the guy to break out in the backfield and catch the ball. He's been the guy to run between tackles. He's kind of done a little bit of everything. So we'd like to think, and, and you being a former NFL player, you could speak to this, but you'd like to think and hope that because he's played technically three different positions and because he's put on the weight and changed his body, that hopefully maybe he could get a look from the NFL. I mean that that's these guys' dream, you know. It, it may happen, it may not, but every kid goes into a, you know into a, into college football, especially D1 you know, scholarship athletes, dreaming of one day playing in the NFL. You know, everyone as a kid does. You know, I hope he gets the opportunity, but but so, who's someone who's played, you know, 15 years professional sports? I can tell you, it's a monster. It's hard. You know, it, it's almost like hitting a lottery. You have to be in the right place at the right time. But I hope he's given an opportunity. I hope he gets a chance and gets a break to be able to go out there and play the game that he loves, you know, continually and, and, and further than college. Absolutely. And yeah. So, 
Everywhere, everywhere you go, Rob. People know Rob everywhere he goes. Everywhere. So it's good. <laughs> Born and raised in Central New York. And every show we've done for almost 10 years now, wherever we go, if there's 100 people, if there's one person, if there's three people, if there's 15 people, whatever, you always have somebody shake your hand. And you just had that here on live radio, live audio here from the Wildcat Sports Club. Just what that means to you that, I mean, there's every, honestly, I mean, you know it, every single time we've done a show live on location somewhere, somebody stops you, smiles, and thanks you. They remember you. They remember a game. They talk about something. I mean, that's got to be pretty amazing, especially for a hometown kid. You know, it's, it's, it's not hard. And the one thing I always say, it's what the Syracuse University football team currently is missing. You know, they're missing a hometown player, you know, that's a, you know, that's a star or a very prevalent player on the football team that was community-based, that was, you know, that was home-based, that, you know, even when I was at Syracuse, I would always go back, you know, and, and talk to high schools. I would always go to community centers. I made myself, you know, you know prevalent in, uh, in the community because I was from the community. I'm not, I wasn't just a Syracuse University football player. I was a Syracuse University, you know, resident. I was born and raised here, you know, so it's, a, it's, it's always respectful and rewarding for me to be able to come back, and I don't consider them fans. I consider them my, my hometown brethren, you know, so it's, it's nothing special for me. You know, it's just something that's, you know, a hometown kid. Even when I retired, there was no choice of where I was going. I could have stayed in Vancouver. I could have went to Philadelphia where I got drafted. I could have lived in New Jersey, yeah. Baltimore, Florida, you know, but I, come, I, I chose to come back home to where I'm comfortable at and where I know people and where I feel welcomed and loved. You know, and, and for you to be here in this community, I want to take some time because you, you do personal training. You also have your rap system that has been utilized to give sports to athletes, help them know where they are, how they could get better, what they could do to improve. The numbers are very, very in-depth. They can be used with any sport, any athlete in the world. People can see how they match up against their favorite athletes. They can see what Kyler Murray's numbers are as a quarterback. They can see their numbers connected to him. Just what you could say about what you do, continue to do for the community, training the young kids, and then with the rap system, being something that is really state-of-the-art and unique on its own. I mean, me personally, I consider it just trying to give back. You know, somebody once told me it's paying it forward. You know, you, you, you do a good deed for someone, and then hopefully you expect them to do a good deed, you know, down the road in life. You know, so if you go do a good deed for a thousand people, you know, now imagine how that blooms and how that, you know, so those thousand people go do, do a good deed for another thousand people, then another, and it goes and on and on and on, and then mushrooms and blooms, you know. I hope one day the world could possibly be like that. You know, I, I'm sad, not so much as sad, but I'm upset to see that we live in a, a day and time to where, you know, it's so much divisiveness. You know, there's so much hate. There's so much anger. There's so much unwillingness to help people who are, who are less fortunate than you. You know, and I could never be like that, you know, because I was blessed and, you know, given a guy's gift to be able to play football, and I use that to my advantage. Whenever I go and speak in school or speak to kids, I always tell them, you know, I'm Robert Drummond, I play football, boom, boom, boom. My short... My speech about football and introducing myself is probably about three minutes long, yeah. but my story about life is the rest of the conversation. So I can speak about football to you for three minutes because that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about you, how to be a successful, kind, you know, generous person who can sit here and shake the hand of everyone and be kind and gentle and be respected by everyone. So that's, that's way more important to me than ever running in touchdowns and scoring up on Syracuse. I always say I'm so much more than a football player, and people, when they meet me, understand that. You know, and for you, so much more than a football player, like you said, I mean, sometimes fans forget that. They forget that these are human beings. Yeah, they're trying to run the ball. They're trying to make a stop, get a sack, throw a touchdown pass, kick a field goal, whatever it may be, return a punt, but they're human. And, you know, you and I talked about it a little bit earlier today, but, you know, there was times where DeVito was getting – booed, harassed, or, you know, right outside of the press box, there was a guy screaming at him in the second quarter, and his numbers were good at halftime. His numbers were good in the game. Like I said, I believe it was 27-35, 287 passing yards, no interceptions, four passing touchdowns, one rushing touchdown. That was a 36-yard run. He had a 60-yard run in the first quarter of the game. Nobody said he could run, and he obviously took off. So, you know, I mean, I just sometimes I don't get it how people could be so hard on these guys that are obviously not trying to lose. It's not like they're lining up on the field and running into their own end zone and giving points to the other team. You know, pe people or athletes or persons who've been there and done it before understand it, so those are the ones you never really see screaming. 
You never see me yell at a player. You never see uh, Michael Owens yell at a player or Billy Owens or Derek Coleman or anybody who's ever played the game, sport, whether it be basketball, football, soccer, whatever it may be. You always see the people who've never done it before and have these huge expectations of these young kids that are yelling and screaming. Yeah. They're 18, 19, 20-year-old young adolescents. You know what? Like, give right. these kids a break. They're not out there to mess up or have bad games. They're trying. You know, and you can respect that. You know, half the people yelling and screaming couldn't play the games themselves. You know, that's why you're not a Division One athlete because you can't play. So you want to be an armchair quarterback and criticize these young men who are trying. You know, at least give them enough credit to be able to say that, you know what, they got an athletic scholarship because they were talented. So allow them to be able to foster that talent and grow and become better. Don't rip them apart. There's a reason you're sitting on the couch or sitting in the stand because you weren't talented enough to play. All right, so these guys get out there. They get opportunities. I want to go back to DeVito in this game. He did what needed to be done. I mean, uh, he got sacked. The offensive line's trying to find its footing. Ryan Alexander, one of the tackles, got hurt during the game. You know, Sam Heckle's still out, and he has one of those rare diseases. And so we're hoping that, you know, a speedy recovery for him and that he gets to not only play the sport he loves, but more importantly, that he gets to live a life where he gets to be 100% healthy. You know, I look at Tommy's numbers, and I said it to one of the guys. I said, if this was Dungy, people would be happy. Eight incompletion, 20-some-odd completions, four touchdowns, passing one, one rush in the ball. I mean, these are good numbers. So do you think he's taken some unfair criticism having been the starter for now four games? 100% uh, uh, you know, uh, unnecessary criticism. But the, at the end of the day, all Tommy DeVito has to really go out there and impress and improve he's good to are his coaches and his teammates. Fans don't matter. I mean, I mean no disrespect to any fan or anybody out there who's rooting or cheering for him. But, but you know what? The heck of a kid who's, who's giving 100%, you know, busting his behind to be the best possible athlete he can be, you know, and, 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 and putting that helmet on, you know, going out in front of the fans who's some booing him, things of that nature. And he reads social media. Believe it or not, these kids do. They have Instagram and Facebook and all whatever else is out there. I have no idea because I'm not a social media expert. But, yeah. you know, I, I give him a lot of credit because for, for, for the criticism he's taken. To be able to go out there and just perform, just love the game. Don't you know? Block out all the extra stuff that's going on, you know, outside of you. Just play the game of football like you do. You know, and, and that's the thing. He went out in this game and he played and he did what he needed to do and he found success going out there and doing it. I mean, it, to me, he looks a little bit more comfortable. He responded well, and you know, he handled business. You lose forty-one to six to Clemson, and he found a way to bounce back and. And it was funny, I talked to Aaron Service on the offensive lineman, one of the vets on the line after the game, and I was standing next to him in the post-game press conference, and he looks at me, and he had his stuff in his hand, he said, he said, what's up, Dan? I said, how you doing? And he nudged me, and he, I said, congrats. And he said, it's good, it's good to finally get a win. And he looks at me, I went to say something, he goes, it's good to finally score some points, too. So, I mean, this offensive line, they not, they're trying, and they're getting there, but, you know, it's got to feel good to put up 52 in this game. A win, a victory always feels good, you know, but at the end of the day, you're still going to have to watch that film tomorrow, and I can tell you, they themselves, they know the mistakes they've made, and those mistakes are going to be plastered on that film and immediately in front of everybody, yeah. you know, but you know what, you got, you got the victory, you can, you can always correct mistakes, just like taking a test, you can always correct this test, you know, so what, no one's perfect, you know, you're not going to get 100% graded out, you know, you might get one or two wrong, so that's what football is the same way, you know, it's like a lesson in life, you know what, they can correct those, correct those mistakes, be ready for Holy Cross and be able to go out there and now iron those out and just play the game. As you notice, I keep saying, play the game they love. Yeah. You have to love this game to do well. You have to play the game you love with heart, compassion, you know, and control. You can't go out there out of control and play with anger. You have to play with love and compassion for the game. And I hope this, these guys get to it because that will carry on, carry them on throughout the rest of the season. Absolutely. As we're here with Rob Drummond, and Syracuse Orange football alum, 1987 undefeated team, NFL, CFL, Played for a very, very long time in this beautiful I sport. I a very, very long time. I'm I not see, it's credit to you. It's credit to I'm you. Joking. You know, running back. Running backs expectancy in professional football is like 2.3 years or something ridiculous. I just say I played for a long time. How many time. pro years did you play? Know, How many pro years did you play? A lot. How many? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'm trying to give you some credit here, man. I tell, I tell you what, I'm trying to do it right by you. I played zero years in the NFL, so you can combine the age of a few kids in here, and I, and I, you know, and and I played longer than some of these kids have been alive. How about this? Rob went undefeated when I was two years old. Wow, <laughs> there you go, man. 
Woo! It's all good. You grabbed my collar. But that's <laughs> that's it. It. <laughs> that's it. But we're but we're best friends, right? We're good. We're good. We're okay. Good. We're best friends. God brought us together. You know, you could have carried me like the football on the field that day. That'd have been fun. Uh, that, that was a, that was a long time ago, you know. But it was. hopefully they can get back to those days. You know, that's when the dome was just it was fun. I would let I mean, you carry me on the field too, because you didn't fumble that much. No, so I, didn't, no I, I wasn't a fumbler. You know? I think at one point you had over seven yards of carry. Yeah, like seven point six yeah. or something like that, which is insane. Yeah, in a backfield with Donnie McPherson, Moose Johnson, and Michael Owens. Yeah, so that's pretty doggone good. Yeah, you had yourself a, a nice line, and like you said, in the top three with Ernie Davis and Jim Brown in career yards per carry. Mo Neal could do something about that as he goes on this season. The rushing attack looked like they got more involved in this game, which was good. Javion Howard was able to run the clock out. Mo Neal was able to do his thing. Abdul Adams was able to push forward. But Tommy DeVito on the ground, how about this? Dino said, listen, we always knew he could run. Dino's like, I know he can run. Y'all don't know he can run, but I knew he could run. He ran for 96 yards on two carries. Young man, young man just has to relax. Yeah. Go out there and play his game. Don't see, don't care what the fans say. Don't care what the media say. Don't care what the public say, patients and all these books and everybody else say. Just yeah. go out there and play the game like you played in high school and when you loved it and when you were elite, one of the top elite quarterbacks in the country. Love the game of football and just have fun with it. One of our viewers said that he loves that Justin said he loved that you were trying to pump the brakes on the DeVito hate this week. I've been trying to I'm trying to pump those. I'm trying to tap those brakes too. Like, wait a minute, just wait a minute. Four games. You know, ignore it. As I said, there, there are people that can't play themselves, so they take their frustration and anger out of somebody who's at least trying, given an opportunity because he was talented enough to play. Yeah. You can't be there, so don't be mad at a young man that's good trying at least. You know, if yeah. you were talented enough, you would have gotten a scholarship to play at Syracuse or Penn State or Tennessee or UConn. Or, but you didn't. So sit yeah. in it, sit in it, sit in the stands, sit in the couch, be quiet, and watch young men who are at least trying. And the thing is, they're, they're like you said, they're trying to get there. They're not trying to lose. They're trying to have success as they step forward this season. Uh, Francis, Francis says Tommy is just fine. Five touchdowns today, getting a victory. The defense had a rough third quarter. They got outscored. The team got outscored 20 to 14. Offense got a little bit quiet. Defense allowed 20 points. They only allowed. 14 points the entire first half, or 13 points the entire first half. They allowed 20 in the third quarter, but I want to pump the brakes on that, too. They forced two fumbles, recovered those, and at the end of the game, Eric Coley, strong safety, had not one but two stops on the same drive. Third down knocks the ball away. Fourth down tight coverage, forces a turnover on downs. On the next Western Michigan attempt, he intercepts the ball. Those last two possessions of Western Michigan – those possessions that they had when they stopped that, Eric Coley prevented a team that had three minutes. There was still time on the clock for Western Michigan to come back, and Eric Coley took him out of one possession and then took him out of the second one. I want to give some credit to Eric Coley and show him some love because he doesn't get enough. He's one of those guys that's using rotation in the secondary that's gone through some injuries, but I want to give him a shout-out because he went to work in this game. You know, Eric did a great job, you know, and I, and I have an affinity for Eric, you know, uh, Eric went to pay for Manly High School. One of my one of my sons, my eldest sons, you know, one of his best friends, you know, along with two other kids I consider uh, children of me, uh, Kyle McGee, you know, and Jared Shaw, you know, so they're they're all the best of friends. So I know Eric, you know, off the field, and what a yeah. great young man, you know, and for him to be able to to, to get the opportunity to go into a game and um and, and perform and perform at a, a high level in front of you know family and friends in his hometown, you know, is is it's just it's exciting for me, you know, it's 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 got to be tough. To, to, to be behind Andre Sisco, you know, that kid's a perennial superstar. Yeah. You know, so you're going to get a little bit of time with him there, but be able to give it a, give it a chance, give it an opportunity to go into the game and shine, as you say, perform and do well. Yeah. You know, just, 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 just goes to show the type of, you know, not just person, but athlete he is. Great athlete, great kid, you know, and I'm glad he did well, and I hope he gets more opportunities. Yeah, you know, and he's definitely worked his way up to get those opportunities. Uh, Francis said, Clemson's game was kill the quarterback, and they executed it well. I mean, they put a lot of pressure on Tommy, but you you know that. I mean, if you're the number of, and can, can we say this? Can we maybe say this because Sonny Spira, who played basketball at SU, came onto the broadcast, and Sonny Spira talked with me this past week on, on uh, Wednesday show. And as a former basketball player, he's like, listen, I'm Syracuse through and through, 
and he said, I'm done with the Tommy DeVito bashing. I'm done with all this hate. He said, you can critique this, that, and the other thing, but leave these kids alone. They're kids. And we were talking about it, and he said, can we just talk about the fact that Syracuse lost? Everybody's freaking out after Clemson. They lost to the number one team in the nation. And then I, cut, and then I went on top of that and said, since 2015, Clemson's won 58 games. They've lost four. One of the teams they lost to, Syracuse. So in 62 games, they won 58 of them. I think it's fair to say they're a pretty good team. So Syracuse losing to Clemson isn't necessarily a litmus test of where this team is, in my opinion. Oh, not at all. I mean, Clemson's an elite program, one of the elite, elite programs in the country, if not the elitist program. You know, so losing to Clemson is not a bad thing. It's a, I mean, as I said, it's a lesson. Every win was a lesson. You cheered, and you got right back to work and try and figure out how to beat your next opponent. Every loss was a lesson because you it, it burned for a little bit, but then you got right back to what? Learning about your next opponent. Right. Because it's always about the next opponent. Right. Coach Max said in the year we went undefeated in 1987, every single game was one down, one to go. Even after we lost, uh, excuse me, even after Auburn tied us in the Sugar Bowl, you know, we got over there after a while, but it was, uh, you know, that game's over. Let's get ready for next season. And immediately after that, we got ready going to the, getting ready for next season. So games are about lessons in life. You know, you win some, you lose some, you learn from them, you move on, you learn. You smile sometimes, you frown other times, but it's a lesson about how to, you know, how you persevere, you know, get through it, yeah. you know, get yourself better and get ready for the next challenge. And, and we look at this too. Eric Dungy did a lot of great things and went plenty of seasons four and eight. Tommy DeVito's halfway there, four games in. He wins two more games, he's on pace to what Dungy did, and Dungy, so it's like everything is relative, and, and but it, it's like a double-edged sword because I'm really, really excited that Syracuse got to 10-3 and three and the fans got excited. They started buying tickets. They got back in the stands. It's good. They should have been in the stands the whole time because that's what a true fan does. But they're in the stands, right? Just because you went 10-3 and three last year doesn't mean you're going to go. They went 3-9, and 4-8, and 4-8, and 4-8. and eight. Before that, Greg Robinson won 10 games in four years. So it's going to take time. Just because you got to 10 wins one time doesn't mean you're going to do it every year. So I want the fans to be excited. I want the fans to fill the seats. I want them to make it the Loud House. I want to lock the dome in. I want to get these guys, you know, in this heated dome, doors are locked, can't get out for four quarters. I want that. I also want people to know the offensive line's gone through changes. Tommy DeVito's had four games as a starter. The linebackers have gone through two years of losing vets. I told everybody about this going into the season. It reared its ugly head early on in the season, but that's not me saying that they're not trying. They're trying. It's just... It takes time. Zaire Franklin wasn't phenomenal day one. Eric Dungey wasn't great day one. Mo Neal was used all over, but trying to figure out who he was. They, I mean, he was he's put on like double his weight now. So everything good in life takes time. How many marriages have been successful meeting the girl in that night in Vegas going, let's get married? You got it takes time, brother. You know what? Um, if you're not going to be a part of the solution, don't be a part of the problem. You know, right. it's, it's, if, you, if you just want to sit there and ridicule players who are giving their heart out but not, but not performing up to what your standards are, what you consider, you know, top tier football, then stay home. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't need players like that. You know, even during the Greg Robinson era, my, I bleed orange. I still love my Syracuse football. I wanted to perform better, but it wasn't the kids' fault. They were trying. They were just put in situations that they they weren't allowed to be successful. Yeah. As with any good thing, it takes time. I remember, as I said before, last week, under Coach Matt, we started up in 1986. We started up 0-6, excuse me, 0-4. Yeah. And then people were booing and fire Coach Mack and things of that nature. And then we ended up turning uh, uh, turning the season around, you know, and getting, getting to 5-6. and six. But Then the next year, what happens? Boom. We go 11-0. Then after that, we go 10 and you know. So yeah. it's going to take time. You know, it'll eventually happen. And let these kids go out there and do what they're good at. They're good at playing football. They're good at being humble, smart, respected kids that just love to play a game. So give them that opportunity to do that. They don't need to see all this negativity about them in social media. And then you can say you can't just sit here and say, we'll turn off social media because social media is a part of everybody's life. Unless you're living in a bubble, unless you're living underneath somebody's attic or in a closet somewhere, social media affects and you know everyone see everyone sees it because it's somehow I say that's how I get the news. I don't watch television that much because there's so much going on in politics I don't want to see, so I try and just stay on social media. And, 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 but that has it also, but it's just a quandrum. But at the end of the day, if you're not going to support him, just don't be negative about him. Just stay away from him. That's all I say. Yeah. And one of the fans said today, out of curiosity, did they announce the attendance 
I don't think they did at the game today. I'm going to say it was like close to 30,000, somewhere around there. Maybe maybe the high 20s, but it, it looked like it was it was somewhere around maybe 30,000 at the game today. Because and he was very 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 big crowd. You're very 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 analogy. <laughs> You know, but, but give Dino a chance to bring out the best things. Absolutely. So, but I want to give a shout out to Sean Riley today. Now, his interview is going to be on the show this week. Wake Up Call with Dan Satora normally broadcasts every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on MixLR.com backslash Wake Up Call BT for internet streaming radio. And then internet streaming videos right here on Facebook.com backslash Live Now DT. So listen in for my conversation with Sean Riley after this game. But I told Dino about this. I said something to Dino. I said, what can you say about special teams? Sean Riley, most kickoff attempts ever in Syracuse history, most kickoff return yards ever. And he looked at me and he goes, really? That happened today? Sean Riley? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, you know, seemingly it's been like he's been, like he's been here forever. I talked to Sean about it. He set the record in the first half of this game with, I believe, 107 kickoff return attempts and 2,299 kickoff return yards passes everybody. That includes the Kevin Johnsons, the Clinton Spot, like anybody who returned that, the ball. That, that would, that's what owning the record means. He passes everybody. No, but that's I'm saying, good. like, some of these names, Rob, mm -hmm. some of these names oh, yeah. Yeah. that he's yeah. passing, Sean Riley today. I was a kick returner my freshman and sophomore year. Yeah. But you look at this, like, today, today. He creates a new record of kickoff return attempts and kickoff return yards. And I want to shout him out and show him some love because special teams doesn't get enough of it. And he's played wide receiver all four years, too, as well. You know, it's a, it's a testament to that young man and what he's capable of for the simple fact that you can be able to go play on offense and play special teams because you get absolutely exhausted. You get absolutely super tired. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a tough situation. But to be put in a situation to where you, the, the coach, you know, entrusts uh, you enough to be able to put you in on offense and put you on special teams says a lot about his athleticism and says about a lot about what he means to that team. Absolutely. You know, and he's he's done so much with this team to be where he is right now and sit where he's sitting right now. So I have nothing but the utmost respect for Sean Riley, who he said he's like, it's crazy. It's crazy to sit back and think over 2,200. I mean, for me as a player of four years to sit back and say, and that is a wide receiver just on kickoff returns, but I've accumulated over 2,000 yards. Me? You did on Madden, or was it college No, but I'm, say, I'm saying if it was. I'd be oh, so happy. Oh, if it was. Well, I thought if it was. was. That must be a bad video game yeah, or something. I did. I get it on Rob now. I freak him out, and I go now. So, but no, but really, I mean, like, if that was me, and, I'm, like, and I've seen Sean all the way through. I mean, I've talked to Sean for the last four or five years, and so... You know, after a game away, we see each other. Always gives me a smile. Always, you know, bumps my fist, shakes my hand. So it's a true honor, personally and professionally, for me to be able to see somebody like that do it. And a fellow short guy, a fellow five eight five seven er. That's why I like it even more because he's out there doing this thing, and he's he's a little guy. You know, I, I, congratulations to him. You know, but records are meant to be broken. That's what I always say. When you accomplish me, you can smile for a while. You know, you, you, as, as you said, you know, the Quentin Spotwoods, you know, the Marvin Harrisons, you know, guy, the, the Kadri Ismail, you know, who's a, the Kobe Dog guys, the guys who are amazing kickoff returners and punt returners, and, uh, and to be the one standing on top holding that record, definitely a great record. But at the end of the day, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, that record's going to be broken, and he can sit here and hopefully applaud the young man that does it. Uh, just like I said, I hope Mo Neal and Mitch can surpass. I don't think he's going to get any favorites with Jim Brown, yeah. but, he, but he's close enough to get me. And if he can get me, I'll, I'll be the first person to shake his hand and congratulate him because what an honor to, you know, to be named in the same category as those two great men. Not just what they did for the community of Syracuse, but what they did for the, you know, the African-American community, what they did for you know, the NFL, what they did for college sports. And to be named with them is, is a prestigious, you know, humbling you know, award. And you talk about the community and what they've done for the community. Sean Riley came from California. And where he came from, he said, he was like, he's like, how do I say this? He said, you know, poor poor area, poor housing. He said, I could have chosen a life of crime or I, or I could He's like, I chose to play football. He said, I could have 
I could have been a criminal. I could have played football. I could have, you know, but he chose to get out of that. He chose to get out of a bad neighborhood. He chose to come across the country. So before anything else, I have to give Sean Riley a lot of credit for, you know, being a kid, 17, 18 years old, and wanting better for himself, leaving his life, going across the country and, and doing what he did. I mean, we don't talk enough about that. Oh, oh he, he got seven yards, you know, in, in this game. Or, you know, he had negative carries or he threw an interception. How about the fact that a lot of these kids don't have mom, don't have dad, don't have both, you know, are adopted, came from an inner city, came from a horrible neighborhood, have seen three of their friends murdered by the age of 15. One guy I did an interview with on Syracuse's team. His dad was execution style killed when he was like seven or eight years old. So Sean Riley looking at me today going, not only is it good to have this opportunity and be proud of this record, but Dan, I, I got out. And that's something to say. You know, it, it's a lot of people just right now, they just watch the four hour game. And all they saw was those kids for those four hours. But they had no idea what goes on the rest of the, you know, the, the, the rest of the days and you know the other six days a week. You know what these kids have to go through, their, their lifestyle, just dealing with the animosity, dealing with back home. Yeah. There's so many things to deal with. These kids are human too. They're not some robots that just show up on Saturday to play a game. And you know everything's about football. Everything's about life also. And some of these kids just come from tumultuous uh, what's life is uh, back home. You know, and they deal with a lot of bad things. You know, but I give them a lot of credit to be able to, uh, like me personally. I, I approach games where I would go out there and just take out all my frustration in playing football. That's why I was such a tough, hard-nosed player. I had a chance to legally pound somebody, you know, and not get in trouble for it. Yeah. You know, so you can take off all your frustrations in a game, but then you have you have class, you have social life, you have study, you have there's just so much going on. And for these kids to show up, you know, for the for, the, for these four hours a day or a week, excuse me, and play a game, that's relaxation for them. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing is to be able to get out of there. There's so many guys that are trying to start a new life at 17 or 18, you know, and, and you know, I, I had to, in my own way, start a new life at 33, you know, there's, there's people that have to, you know, my grandmother, having my grandfather pass away, and her having to start a new life in her, you know, early 70s, you know, sometimes that happens, you know, you go through divorce, you start a new life, you go through a breakup, you start a new life, you have a child, that's a new life, you know, so, there's so many things that go on, but these are children. These are babies saying, I could have stayed in North Kissimmee, Florida and gotten shot like five of my friends, or I could have worked my butt off in the classroom, done really well on the football field, and gotten the heck out of there and given myself an opportunity. So I just want people to know that the fourth string kick returner, the fifth string wide receiver, the, se the backup quarterback, the second string punter, they may be that string to you, but they've already succeeded in life by getting a scholarship and starting a new life. That, that, that's one reason I, I, I always gave the walk-ons on our team a lot of credit and a lot of respect. You know, because I always sat there and said to them, I was like, my gosh, you know, you're, you're paying to go to school and you're going through this also? Yeah. You know, the fact that you can pay to go to Syracuse means your life is okay. It's pretty good. You know, Syracuse teams are probably would be depleted probably 80 80, 90 percent of some of those guys had to actually pay, pay to go to Syracuse University. University at seventy-one thousand dollars a year. A lot of those guys can uh, can afford. I know for a fact can afford that. You know, so yeah. But but the walk-ons who would come in and do everything we would do, you know, weren't didn't get didn't really play in the games where we would try to get to the point where we could beat the opponents enough to where they could get in the games because you know they earned that from the hard work, the dedication, everything they put in, just showing up to practice, showing up to meetings, showing up to everything. You know, and still having to pay to go to school. So I gave them a lot of credit because it's just as hard on them also because they, they put a lot of hard work and effort into it. For us, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it was expected because we were getting the free education. For them, they weren't getting the free education. They still were doing it. So I right. give those guys a lot of credit and a lot of respect. And and I think it's worth noting that our starting kicker, who's the only one in the history of Syracuse to get the Lou Groza Award for the nation's top kicker, was a walk-on. Yeah. Yeah. Andre Schmidt was a walk-on, folks. And people didn't know who he was. When we looked at the depth chart, we thought Sterling was going to be a kicker and the punter. And then all of a sudden, there's Andre Schmidt, and everybody said, why? And Dino said, we take numbers every practice, and he has the best numbers. He said, based on what we look at, he's the guy that, numbers-wise, was the best opportunity and the best option. So 
he got it. I want to want to let everybody know that off the camera right now, a young child wearing a Cowboys jersey gave a thumbs up to a former Eagles player. Give a thumbs up to me. Eagles right here. Look at that. And he's like, <laughs> he's an Eagle Jaguars. Eagles. Jaguars. Eagles. Oh, wow. Hey. From the, from I love how it's from, in division. From, from a young man. And he hears now. Eagles and he boos you and then he calls me trash. Look, we don't even play the Cowboys. We don't even mess with the Cowboys. Yeah, garbage. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, garbage, though. What? The Jaguars? Outside of the Patriots, the other one in there. You say Patriots? Yeah, listen, the Patriots over here. Got some young young men in the corner here with teams. I just like the fact that you got a thumbs up from a Dak Prescott fan. It made me happy today. He don't, he don't know no better. He's he too, he too young. It made me so It made me happy. It made me happy, Rob. So what do you think about your Eagles? Can we talk about your Eagles for a second? Oh, In this Syracuse post game, we'll talk about the Eagles for a second. By the way, the Jaguars did get that dub. And Gardner Minshew, look pretty, he looked pretty awesome. Wow. Man, please. <laughs> Gardner Minshew looked okay. Man, that's so, I mean, I, 22 or 25, 20 for 30 for a backup rookie quarterback. His numbers are pretty damn good. Nine sacks. Not on us. But I'm just saying, the that's Jaguars that's, 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 the yeah, other nine team. Nine so, yeah, Marcus I mean, Mariota, nine you're, sacks. You're not going to score many points, you know. It's because the Jaguars right? got one of the best defenses in the nation. We had the first two weeks. Or first week. The first week? Yeah. They had a bad week. <laughs> no, it's a bad week. They're not a good team. They're not a, they're not a great team right no, now. They're, no, not at all. I, think that, no. I, I think they could get eight wins. Eight and eight. Maybe nine and seven, which doesn't make them a great team. You press But them. listen. Yeah. I'm telling you. If they lose Jalen Ramsey, no way, Aiden Nate. Well, if they lose Jalen Ramsey, yeah, that's the difference. But pretty much everybody on the defensive line depth chart had a sack on Marcus Mariota on Thursday night. I think I had a sack on Marcus Mariota. Yeah, I did. I caught him going out. I grabbed him on the way out. <laughs> Holy smokes. Yeah. Yeah, but, no, but my Eagles, I got um, Eagles can be a good team. You know, they're trying to, they got to figure themselves out. You know, I think the Cowboys are a strong team in the division this year. They really haven't played anybody yet, you know, and they won't play anybody this week, you know. But they'll be tested, you know. For them, it's just – it's a good thing because it's 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 just like practice to them. And I don't mean no disrespect to all the other players in the other team. Yeah. But um, they're, they're definitely not the Cowboys caliber. So the Cowboys can go out there and work on a few things until they get to the point where they start playing the more elite teams. They're going to start playing a more elite team pretty soon can after we, this week, you know. But for right now, it's just tuna form, and they do look good. Can we talk about the fact that Antonio Brown was on three teams in, like, what, three months? The, the worst wounds, I always say, on this self planet are self-inflicted. Antonio Brown's out of football because Antonio Brown wanted to be out of football. Antonio Brown did what he did to himself. Yeah. No one did it to him. Well, this is the crazy thing. People wonder, was it the Steelers or was it him? Or was it both? And obviously we know that it was him. It was him. You know, I said, don't never trust a man who bleaches his mustache blonde. Just don't do it. But this is a guy who's a prima donna who wanted attention. He was regarded as the number one fantasy wide receiver in the nation. He was regarded as one of the best wide receivers, if not, if not the best wide receiver of 32 teams in the NFL within the last couple of years. And then he goes to the Raiders, and he gets frostbite on his feet during cryotherapy, and then he wants to wear the helmet, and then he's doing this and doing that, and I'm going to play and I'm not going to play. Then he gets bumped off the team. The Patriots sign him in a half a millisecond. Bill Belichick proves that he's made a deal with the devil, signing Antonio Brown on top of everything else that's happened there. And then amidst all these sexual assault allegations, which now I believe there's two at least, now he's off that team. So he's played about 15 seconds in the NFL, and he's out again. Three teams, and now he's gone. The NFL released a statement and sent it over to me as an accredited member of the media and said that, you know, he's an unrestricted free agent. So as of right now, he can still play, but they're looking into all the allegations. I think the NFL needs to do the NFL a service and show these kids that talent doesn't outdo how you treat people. Yeah, by, by the way he treated the NFL and what he did and how he went about it, the NFL is probably going to use him, use him as an example, which I have no problem with. You know, at some point, you know, you're a grown man. Be humble. Be smart. You know, it just... You're, you're, the, the fact that, I mean, I think something may be psychologically wrong with him, personally, because you know, who, who does that? Who turns on $30 million? I mean, that, that's guaranteed. It's in your pocket. Uh, regardless of if you want to be in another team or not, you know, that's that's money that you can 
set your you know your your family up for generations, you know. Right. So for him to do that, you know, he's an idiot. So now what's he get off of that? You know, one game check for playing with the Patriots, and now he's done. I'm telling you, no team's gonna sign him. No, and why should they at this point? And that's the problem that we come into. It's how quickly somebody can fall out of this. But I tell people all the time, your life eventually <clears throat> will right itself. Yes, it will. If you're a good person and you feel like you've been treated unfairly, eventually it'll all come back to you. Those riches will come. And I don't mean just money. And then on the other side of it, if you're a crappy person and you get away with murder, eventually, I mean, for God's sake, Bill Cosby's going to die in jail. Did it to himself. R. Yeah, Kelly, bro. Did it R. to R. Kelly, it? what, 14 years? Like, how, how many times you get in trouble, nothing happened, you, and now he's going to jail? There it goes. Let me, let me ask you a question. Do you think they knew what they were doing was wrong? Yeah. <laughs> that's doing it to yourself, then. All right, if I'm doing something I know it's wrong, I stop. Right. You know, I know, I know, I know, I know not only can I get in trouble, but I'm hurting somebody else. So why would I do success. that? All the money in the world, all the prestige in the world could have anybody you want, could go anywhere that you want, and you give up your entire life because you did something wrong thinking that you were above God. And Antonio Brown did it over and over and over and over. Right, Our Kelly did it over and over and over and over. Bill Cosby did it over and over and over. Look at the guys who keep doing things over. Right. Look at that. I'm not to get into politics, but look at these guys that do things over and over and over again. Yeah. Holy smokes. You know what? If I make a mistake, I own it with my mistake, and I never repeat it. Right. You know what? It's my bad. You know, I'm at right. fault. You know, I learned from that. I never do it again. I'm a good person. You know what? Bad people don't. Right. Because bad people think that what they're doing is not wrong. They think they're above the law and that the rules on the platform. They try to out-talk it. But that's the thing is, talent trumps everything, not my book. Yeah, my, my now, you know, you're either a good person in my book or you're a bad person. You know? And that's the way it goes. That's life, you know? Yeah. And I look at Syracuse for this, too. And I want to credit the coaches of the past and Dino for this. They don't put up with BS. How many times do you hear about Syracuse players in the last 10 years getting arrested for this, arrested for that? They might lose some games, they might win some games, but they're not bad people in the community. And that doesn't count in the win-loss column, but it counts in my book that at least Dino is not sacrificing morals and integrity and in the safety of our community just to bring in talent. No, but in that, in that same respect, kids are going to be kids. You know, I, I expect kids to make mistakes. But, but the, 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 the men I just, the gentlemen I just explained to you, are all adults, are all, you know, 30, 40, 50 years old. You know what? Yeah. R. Kelly, older gentleman. Antonio Brown, older gentleman. You know what? Uh, Bill Cosby, older gentleman. Every politician, older gentleman. Yeah. They're not supposed to make mistakes at that point. When you're an 18, 19, 20 year old, you know, adole young adolescent, you know, college student, you're going to make mistakes. That's how you learn. You right. learn how to repeat them. So those kids I'll give a pass to, it, you know, if, if they made mistakes. But as you're an adult, you're older and you're out there in, in, in the working world, you're, 27, 28, and much older? No, you don't get a pass. No. Absolutely. You know right from wrong. Absolutely. That coming from Rob Drummond, myself, Dan Satoro, we're going to be wrapping up the post game of Western Michigan at Syracuse. Want to let you know you can follow us back here at the Wildcat Sports Club, 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus, New York, right after the game. It's about 15 minutes from the dome. Straight shot, just jump on the highway, find your way over here, right off the Hinsdale Road exit in the Home Depot Plaza. Come and see us next week, Saturday, September 28th. I'm going to say 5 p.m. since this game took four hours. So we are oh trying to get here at 4.30, but 5 p.m. We'll say that for next week. We'll be out here doing post game. So following the post game interviews, following the game, Dino Babers talking and the players talking, you can find us here at the Wildcat Sports Club. Holy Cross at Syracuse is at noon, Saturday, September 28th. Rob and I will be here for the post game show immediately following. So we'll say right around 5 p.m. on Saturday, September 28th. Outside of that, Rob, let's take a look at a few other things that happen in, in the NCAA in football. We'll just take a little, little look at the scores, see how things are going. While we're talking right now, Florida State was up big time. They were making it, making it happen against Louisville at home. Louisville's come all the way back. It's 21-17. Florida State lost at home to Boise State to open the season. They beat Louisiana Monroe at home in Tallahassee the second week by one point in overtime, 45-44. They lost on the road in their only game on the road at Virginia, and now they're back at home, and they could lose this game. It looks like Willie Taggart's in some trouble. Willie Taggart's in trouble if, if, he, if he, uh, he wins this game. You know what? It's not the Florida State of old, and they're struggling right now, but, you know, I, I'm not a Florida State fan, so I can't root and feel for anything for Florida State, you know, so, I mean, I, you, you never want to see a coach get fired, you know, because you don't understand. I mean, I understand how that system works, but you, know, right. you, you, you have to produce. You have to become better. Absolutely. We look at some of the other scores that are going on while we're talking. 
Auburn's on the road at Texas A&M, two top 25 Auburn. teams. What? Hate Auburn. I know you do. Auburn's beaten, but how about this? Jimbo Fisher didn't put up a fight against Clemson this year, did last year, didn't put up any fight this year, and is getting beat pretty well at home right now. Jimbo's having some struggles here in his first couple of years at Texas A&M. He's having a lot of struggles. You know, he left, he left the program that's also struggling, which is Florida State. So, I mean, the way he left that, that program, I think, was a bad thing. But it's, it's, I won't it's say almost it. like he knew something was going down. I can almost smile when I see Jimbo Fisher leaving, uh, leaving Florida State and uh, going with Texas A&M and Texas A&M losing now because of what, how he left um, yeah. Florida State. UCF was down 14 to nothing on the road to Pittsburgh. They turned a 14 to nothing deficit into a 31-21 lead right now. I knew they would come back. UCF is one of the elite teams in the country. They only played four quarterbacks yeah. in the last two years? Yeah, UCF is a pretty doggone good team. You know, Plus, they're getting all those Florida athletes. And shout-out to Dylan Gabriel, who's been getting it done, and they beat Stanford last, last week, too. So going up against the Pac-12 and now the ACC, uh, SMU is taking it to TCU in the state of Texas, still winning their game 31-24. Sonny Dykes in his second season doing a pretty good job with SMU. Uh, TCU, I mean, all those Texas schools are pretty good. You know, that, that, that's a hotbed for recruiting in Texas. And how about Temple? They they take out Maryland after Maryland beats Syracuse by 43. Now Temple's losing on the road to Buffalo, 31 to 10. Temple's been all over the place, and so has Maryland. I do not understand this football season. I mean, uh, you have some, some teams that are hot one week, cold the next. I mean, yeah. it's all over the place. Absolutely. And Louisville has taken a lead, 24-21. So Louisville is down to Florida State's. Florida State was, pardon me, Florida State was up 21 to nothing in the first quarter. They've been outscored 24-0 in the last three quarters and change right now, or two quarters and change, I should say. Florida State has blown a 21 nothing lead at home to Louisville. Who has Scott Satterfield, who's in his first season as a Louisville head coach? You know, that just goes to show you the, the, the turmoil that's going on psychologically uh, yeah. with the players from Florida State. To, to be up 21 points and then get outscored 24 points is just, it's got to be heartbreaking. And how about North Kakalaki, North Carolina, down 34-24 to Appalachian State at home after starting off the season 2-0. and They're 2-1, could be 2-2 two and two after all of a sudden done. Missouri's taking it to South Carolina, 24-14. to New Mexico State and New Mexico are tied at 31 apiece. I want to get to some of these games that finished up. Alabama had no trouble whatsoever. LSU had no trouble. Florida without Felipe Franks, who they lost for the season last week, with Kyle Trask as their starting quarterback, defeated Tennessee in the SEC 34-3. Tennessee's not good this year at all. You know, they go back and forth, but they've been struggling. Wisconsin spanked Michigan, two top two top 13-ranked teams. Michigan, Michigan, Wisconsin 13, Michigan 11. Wisconsin wins 35 to 14 in this game. They've got to be calling for Harbaugh's head pretty soon. Absolutely, he doesn't win those rivalry games. He struggles with games like that. Wake Forest is 4-0, 49 to 7. It is Elon, but Wake Forest still 4-0, setting up what could be a nice matchup to end the regular season for them in Syracuse. The answer's game for Syracuse. I mean, Syracuse can't take after. I won't even say take Holy Cross lightly. But after Holy Cross, they gotta, they got to play every one of these opponents as if these games are the most meaningful games of their lives. And after Iowa State had game day and lost at home, they won today in a basketball game 72-20. to 20. You think they were pissed off after losing that yeah, game day? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> a little bit pissed off. Indiana wins the game 38-3 to against UConn. Stevie Scott, 21 carries, 97 yards, and a touchdown coming from Onondaga County. I asked Randy Etzel about him. He didn't know... Seemingly much going into the game, but he knows Stevie Scott after the game. You know, it seems like no one from the Syracuse area or the Syracuse side really knew anything about Stevie Scott. You know, Stevie Scott, Stevie Scott should be suited up for Syracuse University right now, but it said he's suited up for Indiana, but that's another story for another day altogether. If Stevie Scott was suiting up for Syracuse right now, we'd be talking about RBU again. I think that man's going to find his way into the NFL. Oh, easily. I can't wait to draft him. I said that last year as a true freshman. I'm like, I'm going to draft this guy. He had like seven yards. He was, he was playing well against Ohio State. I was like, you know, this man, and I think in his debut, he had 20 some odd carries for over 200 yards. He's a, he's a special player. But he, he was is. a special player when he was a freshman. He was a special player when he was a sophomore. I'm talking about high school. Yeah. He was a special player when he was a junior. He got a little dinged up a little bit as a senior, but he was, special players just going to all of a sudden become unspecial. I want to give a shout out to Tracy Neal, who's watching right now, Mo Neal's mother. Shout out to the Neal family. They come in, and Tracy, I hope you're feeling better. Because Tracy had a uh, virus, she got sick, 
this past week. So God bless you, Tracy. I hope you're doing well. I hope everything is okay. Got to speak with Shelly Moe, uh, Moe's dad. The Neal family is awesome. I mean, there, there's so many good families inside, uh, you know, the Syracuse team. Super supportive. They're from Gastonia, North Carolina, like I mentioned before. They come up for every game. Come up, go home, come up. I mean, there's three home games in a row. They come up, they go home, they come back, they go home, they come. I mean, it's dedication. And like you said, families. And even though Mo Neal's not a local player, his family sure damn well treats him like he's a local kid because they got their little cheer section all the time. You, you, always, you always support, you know, as a family, uh, an athlete that's at least trying to go out there and better his life and do, you know, do well for himself. You know, I was fortunate enough to, to, to be, um, you know, from Jamesville, you know, five minutes from Syracuse. So yeah. for practices, I would have 20 to 30 of my family members for practice, watching me practice. Like every Sorry other about practice, <laughs> every other practice. You know, what a what a you know what an inspiration it was for me to be able to go out there. And it, because it made me feel like I just wasn't playing a game for myself. Yeah. It made me feel like I was playing for, you know, for, for them. It made me feel like I was playing for the city of Syracuse. It made me feel like I was playing for the community and the coaches and the people that believed in me. And, and you know, and, and what, a, what, a, what a great, you know, advantage to have, you know, for, 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 for young kids to be able to, to have family members and have those to support them, to be able to turn, when you make a mistake, to be able to turn around and look at the stands and see somebody, you might be getting booed, but you see your mother, you see your father, your uncle, your sister, your cousins, yeah. smile at you. And it takes everything away. And that's the biggest advantage I had, you know, playing here at Syracuse. And, you know, the, and, and that's the thing. We ask the fans to come out and support, treat these kids like they're your kids. Like Sonny Spears said, and Rob and I have said it before, you can have your opinions, but don't boo your hometown kids. You're going to show 30,000 strong, don't boo your own team. I mean, they just don't talk negatively about them, you know, because these kids have, you know, these kids have hearts also. These kids have feelings also. Yeah. They're trying. They're trying to do their best. They're trying to go out there and give you the best performance they possibly can. Yeah. Will they come up short sometime? Of course they will. I'm considered a Syracuse legend, but I tell you what, I can go through every game of my career and tell you where I made mistakes and where I messed up, you know? Yeah. And where it's like, you know what, I'm not trying to mess up. I'm going out there and giving you 110% effort, like Coach Hack said. Yeah. If, as long as you give 110% effort, if you make one mistake, that's okay. Don't worry about the fans who are boring and cheer. Turn around. My mother never booed me, yeah. even when I messed up. You know, she would, you know, she would discipline me. You know, or but she never booed me, or never yelled at me, or and never was you know was disappointed in me. She would always say, "Robert, just go out there and just try to do the best you possibly can. You're gonna make mistakes. Yeah. You're a human being. You know, you're not Superman. You don't fly around with a kid, you know, with an S on your chest. You know, that, that's what always made me comfortable. I was able to turn around and knowing I messed up, or I, I would one game against West Virginia. You know, the the, the game we I actually uh, the, the 1987 game where we won to actually go 11 and 0. Yeah. I, you know, people don't realize I had two fumbles that game. And I remember the second fumble, just walking to the sideline, just being so dejected and just being down on myself. And I just, you know, and, and like the fans really didn't boo me, maybe because I was a hometown guy. But <laughs> yeah. I remember just walking to the sideline, just feeling so horrible, wanting to crawl into a hole. And I looked up, and my mother and my sister were sitting there, and they just smiled at me and just started clapping for me. Uh, it made me feel so much better. And to have that, to have that appreciation, that respect, that support, that coming from Rob Drummond, Local grown, locally from here, made it happen here. Did it at JD, did it at Syracuse, did some Pop Warner at West Genesee in the backyard of the Wildcat Sports Club, where we are for pre and post game throughout the season for the Syracuse football home games in 2019. Want to thank Danny Tom and the entire team here at the Wildcat Sports Club. They're our team, they're your team. 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus, New York. Wake Up Call is proud to do the exclusive West Genesee show here every month, as well as Syracuse home game pre and post, and so much more, and have this be the exclusive home of fantasy football. The Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora. Shout out to all of our owners that are local here, the Dream Chasers, Gridiron Gurus, Keys Contenders, and Captains on Call. Uh, Rob, to wrap up today, I want to do a little rapid fire. We've done this before, so I'm going to ask you three questions. You're going to ask me three. Unprepared, I have no idea what you're going to say. You have no idea what I'm going to say. Shout out to all the former Syracuse players that not only watch today's show, but have watched Rob and I for years and listened, and to all of you that listen and watch Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora on MixLR.com backslash Wake Up Call DT for radio and for video right here on Facebook.com backslash Live Now DT. The fact that I have Syracuse alumni watching this, I cannot thank you enough. It means the most to me, my heart, and I, I just, I, I mean, I grew up, Learning about you, watching you, respecting you, and appreciating you. 
and the fact that the fact that you turned my show on, I, I don't even have words for that. I appreciate that more in life. So it means a lot. Okay. It well, means a lot well, to well, me. Why wouldn't I, though? I mean, no, but I'm saying to everybody. Okay, to okay, Nate, to Shelton okay. Prescott, to okay. Kyle McIntosh, right. Ian McIntosh, all the families. You know, mo most of the time, mom and dad and grandma and grandpa are not wa girlfriends. Or wanna, they're not watching and listening to shows because they don't want to hear what people because they're afraid of all the negativity and the yeah, hate. Yeah, and these yeah. parents and grandparents, what they watch the show. So I just, for being a little kid that grew up in this city, and idolize these character, the, these these wonderful, wonderful athletes. You know the fact that, that you all spend time watching the show. You know, but all, all you can really do I'm is what, what I tell you all the time: just go out there and be a good person. You're a good person. You try. You try and make other people's lives better. You try and bring entertainment. You try and bring the yeah. true story. You know, to, to to the people. I mean, I respected that from the first day I met you. You know, it's it's not about being a. You know, I can sit here and be a reporter. Be like, what do you think about the game? Right. That, that's that's not what real reporting is about, you know. You, right. you, you, you go off someone's emotions, you go off their feeling. If someone is hurting, you put you know you put a microphone down and you care about that person. You can always get an interview a week later, two weeks later, you know. But at that moment, at that time, at that feeling, it's about being a human being. And I always say that, you know. So that's why I say I I, I, I want to talk I, I talk to these kids away from the field, and I talk to these kids about life. It's never about you know me, Robert Drummond. Or, former NFL football player, former City University football player. That's all well and good, but talk to me about life. Talk to me about what's going on. Talk to me about how to better your future and how to be a good person. Because all you need to do is turn on the TV and look at these higher up, these people in these powerful positions and how they treat women, you know, and how they treat others who can do nothing for them and how they treat people, you know, who don't have the money or don't have the resources to be yeah. able to put themselves in a position to do better. I'll never be like that. I'll always be someone who take the shirt off my back, even if it's cold outside, to give somebody, give to someone who has less than me. Because they, at the end of the day, it's all about me getting the guy to see my dad one day. And I want to do everything I can in my life while being a good person to eventually one day go see God. You know what? I'm on the right path. And that's the thing. It's, you know, I don't care about, of course I want these players and coaches to win, but I want them to do enough in their life to get back to heaven. I want to see them in heaven. I'm going to be running around with them in heaven having some fun. That's what I want. So, you know, above all things, I just want good people in the community, good people I can connect with. And it means the world to me that former Syracuse players of a year, two years, current players, or, you know, people that will be future players or somebody like yourself, Rob, has played. You know, what I always hear is, Dan, we know that you're different. Like, we know you're a good person. Like, we all know in the locker room who the good guys are. We know you're different. That's why we love talking to you. And, you know, Ryan Bartholomew, he came on the show because started listening. And Ryan Sloan listened to the show and Nate Trout. And, I mean, it, it just, it goes such a long way to be a good person in this world. And you can live your dreams. And, and I live that every day. And, and Rob and I, whether we got one person listening or an entire packed room, we're going to do this show for you. Because to me, it's not about quantity. It's about quality. And I'm on the right path, too. I know that I'm getting my... I'm finding my, my way back home. So, Rob, you know it. I don't care if anybody's listening or everybody's listening. I get to do a show with one of my best friends, and that, that goes a long way. That's, all, that's what it's all about. It's about doing, you know, just, just doing what makes you feel good, making other people smile, making yourself smile inside, and being good people. So with that being said, let's hot seat this thing. Three questions for you, three for me. I want to do rapid fire. All right. Dude, Put okay. you on the hot seat. You beat me the last time that we did that. How well do we know each other? Beat me six to five. Oh. So we're going to do the hot seat today. My first question for you. What is one guilty pleasure food you can't live without? One guilty pleasure food I can't live without. Ooh. Yes, sir. Um, I actually don't like food, believe it or not. Yeah, you said you, I, you, I, you I, eat I, to live. You don't I live eat to eat. I eat to, like, everyone says it about me. I, I mean, I can go, like today, I've eaten nothing. I drank water all day. Yeah, I, and then, I ate almost know, so, nothing I mean, today. I'm, I'm hungry I'm, now. I'm strange like that, you know. I'm but, hungry, though, but, now. But, but I'm a little bit hungry. One food that, oh, I can't live without. Um, wow. That's, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I love, I mean, I can't live without salmon. I, I, I absolutely love salmon when I, when, when I get, to, get the chance to eat it. And I'll ride with you there. I like salmon too. I'll go with salmon. Oh, I love it. All right. What's your next? What's your question for me? Um, your first one. How tall are you really? Five eight. No, you're not five eight, bro. I'm five eight. You're not five eight. How tall are you really? How, five, how tall five, are you? Five seven and what? 
three quarters. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I'll give yeah, you that. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll give not, you that. You're, you're why, not, why are you being so ridiculous? I'm not. I'm why are you coming in? Because I said that you were older today. Because, because are you me, feeling it? Because no, you're in your 50s, no, man? I, Come I, on, I, man. You wanted to go rapid fire. My license I mean, says my license says 5'8". It doesn't yeah. say 6'4". And I can put 5'7 and 3 quarters. You can take it. You know how short my mom is. I got to take what yeah, I can get. Yeah, I do. All right. My second question for you. What is one movie that you would watch every day of your life on repeat? Uh, <laughs> we got to vote for Rudy. He said Rudy. I, I said Rudy. Rudy. Say Rudy. Uh, he said Rudy. I'd say Son of a Woman, um, an old school movie with Al Pacino in it. All right. Son of a Woman. Your favorite movie. Yes. I like it. Yeah. All right. What's your second one for me? Um, if you could imp- interview one influential person and ask them one question, who would it be and what would it be? They got to be living? No, they do not. Okay. Um, I'm, can I give you two people? Is is that allowed? I, uh, it's my show. I, it is your show, bro. I, <laughs> I'll allow it. No, because it's different reasons. So I would interview Abraham Lincoln, and I would ask him how he knew he was doing the right thing when the country was divided and people were dying, and he felt the, the, their souls on his chest, on his shoulders, how he stayed the course and believed that he was doing the right thing. So I would say that. Uh, so I would ask him about that. Second one would be Robin Williams, and I would ask him what really was going on in his mind because he was he was like an uncle to me like i was four or five years old when i started watching him like i love making people laugh i love comedy and he inspired me to like do impressions he inspired me to feel comfortable like to put a wig on and look like steve perry and be a raspy old woman named alice and like you know he just inspired me to be myself and not be afraid and so i just i want to give him a hug and just you know, ask him if there's anything we could have done for him. Because he made so many people smile, but unfortunately, so many comedians are are so unhappy. And that breaks my heart because I love comedy. I love making people laugh. And I have all the reason in the world to be happy, and I'm a happy kid. And I, I just, I would ask Robin what really was going on in his mind because I don't believe anybody's a lost cause, but he obviously was in pain. I, I agree with that. My last question for you, Rob, is... Hmm. You're going to call for Robert Barron and I have a question I'm ready. Thinking, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get deep on this one. I'm trying, I'm trying to go all over the place. All right. You got a choice. You can go parasailing, skydiving, or you can or you can hold on whatever that thing is when you hold on to the end of the boat with the skis on. You can do that. Which one do you do and why? Sitting on my ass and at home on my couch and <laughs> <laughs> telling you why I'm not doing none of those. I don't. I don't you gotta, do it. You gotta pick one of them. Anything extreme, bro. I know, but you gotta pick one of them. Okay, so it's just I mean, so skydiving, skydiving, parasailing, eh, or riding parasailing, on the eh. Let's see. Or on the end of the boat. On the end of the boat, is, closer to the ground, on the water, and I can swim. So and you probably that, won't die. That, that right there <laughs> is what I'm doing. <laughs> I have my life vest on, and I'll be cool with that. Because I'm not, I'm not going up in. The, <laughs> only way I'm going in the air is a plane. Yeah, okay. I'm not afraid of heights or anything, but I'm not. I'm not. You're not trying to go up to jump down. Nah, I'm uh, not, are you kidding? Me? I just like the whole parasailing thing. They put you up and they attach you to one to one rope, and you're up in the air with a boat, just holding onto this rope. Like a lot of things can happen. Humans wasn't meant to fly unless it's by plane. <laughs> That's my philosophy. All right. All right, let me get to my question. What am I going to ask? Right. What, yeah, what's your last one? Um, uh, let me think. Oh, look at you. You can't answer. And well, you're the one who came up with it. You, you, you did the same thing, but you're the one who came up with the rapid fire. We've asked right? each other a lot of questions. I've okay, known you um, for a long time. How many licks does it take to get to the no. center? T- center? How many would it be? What um, a lot. what motivates you to keep to keep going when doubters tell you, you know, they don't tell you to stop, but they but they do things that, that make you feel that you're what you're doing is wrong or not not worthy of their time. You and I talk about this a lot. Um, I know. 
you still never told me where I'm What motivates me when when haters are out there? You know, there's there's a line that I just listened to a song by I like Lil Wayne. And uh, he just had a song that I listened to. I don't know how old it is, but it came across my thing, and it's called Ice Cream. And he said, uh, he said, if you if you're a hater, so something like, I said, he said, if you're a hater, I'm eating dinner and you're the waiter, which kind of sat with me. Like haters talk, but like you're the person doing the job. Like you're waiting on me. Like you can hate me all you want on Twitter. But you're serving me my drinks and giving me my food, but I'm the guy that just did the set on the stage. You're the guy that's working here hoping to get enough change to be able to pay for your car this month. So what keeps me going, you know, hate used to really, really, really affect me. I'm not going to lie about it. I know that. And it doesn't nearly as much anymore because, I mean, I've always had a faith in God, but I just focus more on it now. And, you know, I've lost some stuff, you know. I, not lost, but my grandmother passed away, the best person in the world to me. And when she passed away, that really hurt, you know. And then I, I went through a relationship that I put a lot of me into. And I, I don't think all of me, you know, 97% of me was like 150% for most people, but that ended, you know. And so when my relationship ended, I kind of just took a good hard look in the mirror and I said, if I'm getting rid of toxic in my life i got to get rid of all of it so what's the stuff that i don't like and one of the first things when i got her out of my life was well i got to get this hate out of my life i got to get i, I got to stop letting things bother me and second guessing and all that and i can still be better at it you know i, I know i can be but the way i live my life what motivates me is I, you know i believe in god uh, my grandparents are always supporting me you know my mom and my dad are different people but they are they, they support what I do and my dad's come out of the woodwork and, and supported a lot of things. My mom has always been a huge supporter of me. You know, I have people like you. Like I really have nothing to complain about because my friends that I have and my blood family that actually acts as such, I have so many good people in my life. I've been spoiled. I'm not giving any of it back, but I mean I, what motivates me to get out of bed in the morning is if I don't do this, then I'm leaving the world to a bunch of wolves. I know the majority of the media is going to lie to you that they're not happy with themselves, that they treat people like garbage, that they disrespect the players, that they misquote the coaches, that they don't listen, that they don't care about their families, they don't care if they succeed. If a player dies, to them it's not a death, it's just a story. So if I stop doing this, I'm leaving the world to a whole lot of garbage. And I don't want to do that anymore. And I, Rob, I just kind of woke up one day after everything in my relationship, and I just said, you know, I'm done with people treating me like I don't have value. I determine if I have value. I determine if I have worth. So if you're one of my friends and we've been friends for five minutes or ten years and you walk out of my life, good riddance. If you're my girlfriend, my wife, and you do that, good riddance. Because to me, I know I'm a good person. I know how hard I work. I know how much I don't sleep. And I know what I want out of my life. So, you know, I don't worry about the people that walk away anymore because it's their loss. And the mission that I'm on is a bigger mission than their mission to get rid of me. You know why I asked you that? You know what you just described? What? Me. That's what I've been telling you for years. Yeah. And that's why I asked you that. I'm, ex I'm the exact same way. You just you described me. You know what? At the end it. of the day, you're a good person, man. That's why I said. All you have to do is say, when you sat there and say, you're a good person. You're a good person. So that's what inspired you to go out there. And I can see, even in your interviews, even now with me, the goodness you bring out of others. That's why good people come around you. That's why you're given the blessing that you've been given. Yeah. Just keep doing what you're doing, man. Honestly. Yeah, that's the thing is everybody focuses on, I got 30,000 people watching. I got this, I got that. And I'm like, yeah. And some of those people that have that say crazy things just to have you watch them and have you hate them. I speak the truth. They're the same people that like, the, oh, I got 30,000 likes. Who cares? Who cares? I got friends that like me. I got friends that would take a bullet for me. I got a mother who would do anything in the world for me. I found an amazing woman that, that I value very much in my life. I have a dog. It treats me like I'm her dad and loves me like crazy. And this morning when I woke up, you want to know what makes me happy? When I woke up this morning, my dog was laid across my chest with her head right on my chest. And I was like, I did something in my life to make her feel safe and comfortable with me. And that makes me feel like a good human because dogs have unconditional love. So when I feel like I did right by her, I feel like I did something good in the world. And, you know, my grandmother and everything that, that – 
you know, our relationship and being friends with you. I mean, it's just the people that respect me and appreciate me are the best people I know. And the people that don't are the garbage plate of America and so on. So what do I care? I mean, it's always relative. And you always have to consider the source. And no offense, but the people that don't like me and treat me like garbage, these people have lost businesses, they've lost friends, they've lost marriages, they've lost relationships. They are not happy. They're constantly focused on numbers. They're constantly focused on how to make everybody else happy. They're miserable all the time. I can't honestly say that I've lost somebody in my life that I go back in time and go, oh, that was a really great person. I screwed that up. I look at it and I go, oh, I made mistakes. They made mistakes, but I'm better off. Toxic people make those toxic around them. So this is just stuff from people who don't have good feelings or, or good, good intentions for everybody else. Surround yourself around good people. Yeah. And I surround myself with one of the best of them all the time. So with that being said, thank you for asking that question. Because as you know, it's been a long, bloody, gravel, dirty road for me to get to where I am right now. But I think you can sense that my spirit feels good. My energy feels good. So... With that being said, Rob Drum and myself, Dan Satora, we're here at the Wildcat Sports Pub. We'll be with you next week, Saturday, September 28th, post-game, post-game, not pre-game, post-game, because the game's too early. So the game is at noon, Holy Cross at Syracuse. We'll be here right around 5 o'clock, so get in here around 4.30 or so, and we'll jump in here and do the post-game show right after Dino Baber speaks here at the Wildcat Sports Pub, Saturday, September 28th, right around 5 p.m. on 3680 Milton Avenue in Camillus, New York. Rob, as always, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. And Mo Neal, you heard it. He wants to see you do it. Let's make yeah. it happen, Mo. It'd be great to see him. Like, 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 I would love it because I'm close to Mo and I'm close to you. So if anybody's going to do it, let it be somebody I consider a family member. It'd be cool. I mean, I met the young man, and you know, I can just and tell, he wears my number, so I'm I can just tell, like, from from speaking with him, you know, that what a great upbringing this young man had because he was respectful, he was kind, oh, yeah. he was you know, soft spoken. I was like, wow. You know, I mean, you just yeah. going back and you see his these, parents are awesome. Like, I mean, I've never met his parents, but I'm pretty sure they're great people just from oh, the way yeah. they raised. They raised a great young man. Shelly, Shelly Mo, his dad, and his mom Tracy. But like, Shelly was so funny at uh at the spring game. Yeah, I think it was yeah, it was a spring game. So, I'm 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 standing over by Mo and I just go over and say hi to him. You know, because I just wanted to like show him some respect, show him some love. So he looks at me, he's like, "How you doing?" And then Shelly comes up and he goes. He goes, hey, Dan, I think Mrs. Neal is screaming for you over there. And I turn around and Mo's mom, she goes, hey, Wake Up Call, what's up? And she goes, how are you doing, Wake Up Call? And I just went and gave her a hug, and she's a sweetheart. So, yeah, I mean, you know that, like you said, Mo comes from a great family, and I love those kids. You know, more than anything, more than what they do on the field, I've had the privilege, thanks to the coaches at Syracuse, to be around some of, like, the nicest kids in the world. And we're friends. I'm friends with all these guys, so, like, it means the world to me. Like Aaron Service, like I said, just standing next to him and him going, what's up, Dan? You know, like, moments like that, that means more than any interview, that they remember your name and they remember who you are and they appreciate you. Because most of the time, players and the media are not together, but when they see me, it's, it's always like, what's up, fam? And, and that means a lot to me that no matter what happens, they know. Like you said, when you're a good person and you tell their story – but the truth, I mean, you can, I can constructively criticize the team, and not once have they ever come up to me and say, I can't believe you said that. It's like they know what they did wrong. I'm talking about it. I'm being real. But I never disrespect the kids because there's no reason to. There's no reason at all to disrespect them. Just be a human being. Be honest. Be truthful. You no, know, be upfront. Just be who, be who you are. Yeah, and they're doing something that, you know, I, I'm not out there doing. You know, and even if I did play football and I went out there and killed it, I'd still respect it for playing the game. So. Go out there and do your thing, gentlemen. Congratulations on being 2-2. Two and two. Let's see what you got against Holy Cross. Rob and I will be back here Saturday, September 28th, right around 5 o'clock at the Wildcat Sports Club. Thanks to Danny Tome and the crew, 3680 Milton Avenue, Camillus, New York, your home for Syracuse home game pre and post. Rob Drummond, Dan Satora, I'll talk to you soon. Be good people. And happy first day of fall. It's freaking 80 degrees outside, so go have some fun with that. <laughs>